order to really feel it in your heart. I'm just so excited about God's love and what He's doing with these children. You can see how grateful their hearts are to be able to just receive things that they may not ever be able to have and just to spend the time with them. Oh, and I'm out of breath because I've been playing with them. It makes my heart so happy. So yes, I love Acuna, Mexico, and I love the people here, and I'm so happy to see what God's doing here. Oh my God, this is amazing. What, uh, if I was blessed just seeing a video over there, uh, you're missing out. There's so much more being here and, and being just hands-on. It, it's, it's been a blessing. It, it's been over. It's, it's just, I'm overwhelmed. It is uh, the team that is here every day. They're working so hard and they're just giving their heart out to God. And just doing it for His honor and for His glory. It's amazing. It's amazing. Come on. I, I want to take another second. I'm sorry. I bummed that up. I'm so excited. Skip the bumper. I'm better than the bumper. I got my own bumper. Um, I just want to share with you something that was so amazing. I feel like I need to tell, tell you this. We walked up on the site where they're building, you saw the, the kids running in the footing of the new building. And um, let me tell you about that first. So this, they have the place where they feed the, the elderly. And uh, so they're building a new site for that. And I asked Pastor Oscar, I said, so have you raised the funds for this yet? And I loved his answer. He picked the dirt up out of the ground and he said, we bought the land for $5,000, we're paying it $500 a month. That's a lot of money in Mexico. And he took this dirt and he dropped it on the ground. He said, we build by faith. Amen. We build by faith. And it's going to take $20,000 to build the building. And I, I just was so amazed, so amazed at his heart and his passion that you know, when we talk about $25,000 in Mexico, um, we're talking about million dollars in America, you know, and uh, his passion to go after it. So we pulled up on this little site, and they had never done children's street ministry there before. Now, they do these street ministries often. They break out a loudspeaker, and it was so cool because I was expecting something different, and they break out this loudspeaker, and he starts playing the song to the as loud as the speaker would play it. Oh, freak out, dun, dun, dun. freak the chic. And I was like, yeah. And he got all, a whole community's attention. And just in a, in a matter of minutes, 90 kids showed up. 90, they had never been there before. Now the other location they go to, those kids are used to coming, so they have to do what they call fast street ministry because if they stay more than about 45 minutes, they have too many kids, they can't even take care of all of them. So they get up in, throw their tables out, start their ministry and fold them up before all the other kids get there because they have so much resources. And last Christmas or a few Christmases ago, they did one in the plaza and they had, they had enough gifts for a thousand kids. 3,000 kids showed up. They had to shut it down because people were mad because they didn't have enough stuff for all their kids. They had to shut it down. He said, if we had kept going, we'd have had 5,000 kids there before it was over with. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you these kids are just, these people are just hungry, and they preached the gospel to them. We saw people get healed. We saw uh, uh, Giovanni, stand up, Giovanni. Giovanni preached at the street meeting. Come on, man of God. And it was, I don't know what he said, but it was awesome. And uh, people got saved, and it was amazing, and uh, it was just a great time. How many would like to go to Mexico with us? Come on, come on. All right, we're going to do it. You're gonna, you, we're going to get plenty of opportunities next year. Our next one will be the week of Mardi Gras. And so uh, plan for it. We're going to do it. All right? Just want to share that a little bit with you. All right. So have y'all been enjoying this series at the table? We're wrapping it up today. Had it been so good. 
So just as a recap, so we started the first week with an empty seat at the table because Jesus paid a huge price just for you to have a seat at the table and all are welcome. And then the, next, the following week, we did a place of thanksgiving at the table. We went through four laws about thankfulness. And the first law was to the law of keep your fork because the best is yet to come when you're thankful. Then there was the law of stress spelled backwards is desserts. And that's because sometimes thankfulness is the thing that actually changes our perspective. Then we had the law of kiss the cook because heaven expects a response from you because of his goodness and his, and his mercy and, his, and his, what he pours out on us. And then we had the law of eat what's in front of you. Instead of looking at everybody else's plate and seeing what they have, be thankful for the thing that's in front of you. Then we had a place to war. The table is a place to war that came from Psalms 23, where it talks about he sets a table before you in the presence of our enemies. And that as we sit at the table, we can find a place of rest, but not only rest. And I love how Pastor talked about that he anoints our head with oil. He gives us our orders at the table. Our marching orders, once he he brings out a feast before us that he anoints us with all. He says, okay, now I'm either going to tell you whether you're going to rest through this battle or you're actually going to pick up the sword and fight the battle. And I loved how, how he talked about that. And then the last week we camped out in John and it showed how he first nourished our bodies and then he nourishes our soul and he's so faithful to nourish our spirit. So I think that the, the really cool thing about this whole series of one of the things that I was, I was studying is the fact that we go through dispensations and we talk about the dispensation through the Bible of the law, the, the dispensation of grace. And, but, you know, like really you can look at a timeline throughout the Bible in meals. See, you first have the meal in Genesis where they invited, Adam and Eve invited the enemy to the table, and they partook with the enemy at the table. And then we have the Passover, where the, the, the Hebrew people are in bondage in Egypt. And they ha the, in order not for your firstborn son to die, you had to put the lamb's blood over the door. And for those who put the lamb's blood over the door, you were saved. Well, then we have those same people in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, and he provided daily bread for them. And it spoiled, the bread spoiled if you left over the next day because he's our daily bread. Well, then we have Jesus in the New Testament at the Passover dinner that say, this is my body, which I've given for you. And there he's saying that same Passover lamb that you put the blood above the door, that same thing, I'm going to now provide that for you for a household victory over your home. So those of you, I mean, just a side note, for those of you who are believing for your family, you say, I apply the lamb's blood over my door because my whole family will be saved. That's so good. And then we see, it, it, then we go on to the New Testament church, and we see in the book of Acts how they were breaking bread daily together. And then we go to Corinthians where, where we see the 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 table of the Lord and how, okay, you're doing that kind of wrong. And it also in Corinthians, it says, you know, there's some people in Corinthians 5, and you can mark that down and you can look it up. It says, you know, there's some people who you don't have meals with, just FYI. Those people who call themselves Christians, but live a different lifestyle. Because you don't get this, the provision of, of the house of God while living a different lifestyle on the outside. Sinners, absolutely. We have meals with them. People who live two different lives, we don't have meals with them. 
Then you go all the way to Revelation, and it all ties together to the beginning where, where they invited the enemy to dinner. And he's like, full redemption because there's a wedding banquet. The bride has made herself ready, and now it's time for a wedding feast. And it just is beautiful how it shows us and it paints the full circle picture of a complete redemption of God. That's so good. Next Sunday, I don't want you to miss, I'm going to be preaching on the name. It's going to be a powerful time. But today I'm going to talk about a place of knowing that you belong. A place of knowing that you belong. This has been truly one of my favorite series uh, we've talked about a place to belong and the lord has set a place for us at the table not only do we have a place at the table but we have a very special invitation now all of us around uh, certain times of the year we expect invitations in the mail you know graduation parties and then there's people's birthday parties and then there's weddings we we expect those in the mail if you're in relationship with those people but have you ever been invited to um to something that you did not expect an invitation to and it was just a major honor to be able to go i remember the first year that angela and i was invited to the governor's christmas banquet or christmas dinner and it was such an honor to be able to go to the dinner um as a matter of fact, one of my friends was teasing me. He was telling me where I was going. He goes, oh, you're going to go hobnob with the big wigs. It was an invitation to, to, for the people of our state, some of the, the who's who's of our state, and be able to go and be invited was such a, felt like such an honor. I want to talk today about an invitation of honor that's greater than any invitation that you'll ever receive. When the Lord himself, the creator of the universe, God Almighty, invite, invites you to his table to dine with him. Now, I know that some of y'all don't remember this song because you're not old enough to remember, but uh, when I grew up in church, we used to sing a little song. It said, come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. Sing it, Michael. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. That's why our beards are white. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord has invited us to come and dine at this table where you can feast and you can have everything that you want. And it's all for you. It's a special <laughs> invitation. And in Matthew 11, the invitation goes like this. Are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me, and I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. Simply join your life with mine, learn my ways, and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, and easy to please. And then I love this part. And you will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. When I was growing up <clears throat> in church, um, I always had this wrong image of the table. I thought it was a place that I had to labor for. I had to work to get the invitation. I had to do everything just right so that I could sit at the table with the Lord. And, uh, and oftentimes that in itself seemed too much to bear. And it's so true that we have this table with the Lord that really there's a refreshing place and a place of rest. And the requirement, it's so easy. It's so easy. And you have a place at the table with our Father and the family of God. And it's, it's a great connection happens at the table where we find joy and peace and security as well as fellowship. And it cost us nothing because the price has already been paid. And we're special invitation to the table. But we find ourselves sometimes alone at the table. 
And when we find ourselves alone at the table, for a moment it feels like we've been abandoned or that moment that we need to remember, wait a minute, look, I'm all here alone, but I have a promise from God. A promise from God. Now, I understand, I hate to be alone. <laughs> I'm not the guy that likes to go eat alone. How many likes to eat alone? I don't like to eat alone. I always feel bad when I'm sitting in a restaurant and there's someone sitting at the table alone and they're just there eating alone. I, I want to go over and say, hey, can I, can I eat with you? You know, I hate for you to eat alone. Now, I know there's some people that are cool that way. They just like to chill all alone. But I don't like to be alone. Matter of fact, uh, Angela uh, used to travel back and forth to Shreveport to take our kids to see her parents when the, they live here now but, and see my family. And, and she would leave, and I just hated being at the house by myself. I remember one time that I went and slept on Tim and Michelle's couch so I wouldn't be alone. I just wanted company. I just didn't want to be at the house by myself. But I have to tell you that being alone is not always a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing. But because we seek so much of human approval, it has become one of our most treasured idols that we, are, we don't want to be alone so much that we're willing to do whatever to make others like us or to make them comfortable around us, even if it means giving up our identity and who we are and what God created us to be. We're willing to say, look, I, I'll, I'll lessen who I am so that you will like me or so that I will fit in or so that you will accept me. And when we, when we get to that place where we feel like, hey, my identity is in other people's approval, we lose ourselves. We have to know that sitting at the table alone is not only okay, it really is a time of refreshing where we spend time alone with the Father. And when we really understand what it means to belong, it does not require you to change who you are, it requires you to be who you are. I want to say that again. When we really get an understanding of what it means to belong, it doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us or it challenges us to be who God created us to be. When I came back to the Lord at 22 years of age, I had been in drugs and all of those things, been out there in the world, just crazy life. And by the way, when I was in the world, I was a social guy then too. I loved parties. I loved to be where the crowds were. And um, so I was always in the biggest crowd I could find. But when I came back to the Lord at 22, for the next nine months, not that I put a time frame on it, that was just where God called me to. For the next nine months, I spent time alone with God even to the point that my mom began to be concerned about me and she thought that I was depressed or I was something was wrong because raising me she knew that I loved people but really it was a season of my life when when I had said God I, I'm yours I'm I'm giving you my yes I'm all in I'm fully committed to who you are but sadly after being raised in church all my life, I really didn't know who he was. And far less, I didn't know who I was. And so those nine months that I spent alone with God is the foundation of where I am today. Because there was nights that I felt like I was alone and I, I cried myself to sleep a few nights. And there was a few nights that, that was just kind of awkward and uneasy. And I would go to church with people and and um, they would say, hey, you want to go to dinner? And I just didn't feel like I wanted to. Matter of fact, I remember one time my mom came to me, and she had picked out some little girl in the church there, and she said, you, you should take, I don't remember who it was, out to dinner. And I'm like, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested right now in the social aspect of life. I just want to know him. And in those nine months, I, I read the Bible hours on end. I prayed on end. I, I, I spent many, many months just getting to know the Lord. And I believe that was my anchor. I believe that was the moment that I got to uh, had encounters with him 
that will, I will never forget that took place in my heart. And when we experience his presence, we realize that belonging is not being at the table alone, but being with him at the table. And all the goodness flows out of him. And to be with him and get to experience him and the goodness of God and the mercies of the Lord every day. And not only are we at the table, but we learn that he is the table. He's the table before us that we can come to and we can feast and dine on his goodness, on his love, on his mercy, on his grace. And it's a huge table. It's a huge table. In Psalms 27, the scripture says, My heart will not be afraid, even if an army rise to attack me. I know that you are there for me, so I will not be shaken. Here's the one thing I seek above all else. I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house, finding sweet loveliness in his face, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace. I want to live my life so close to him that he takes pleasure in my every prayer. And we're invited to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you know what it means to dwell in the house of the Lord? It's not what you're doing necessarily here on Sunday morning. But his dwelling place is the constant table of his goodness. It's the constant table of coming to him and spending time with him and, and being in his presence where we become partakers of the goodness of who he is. I find this funny that, you know, when Angela and I got married a long, long, long time ago, <laughs> almost 27 years ago, that we came from two completely different worlds. Two completely different worlds. Even though we grew up in the same town and same church, our families were com operated completely different to say the least. And at the beginning of that relationship, there was definitely some conflict over little things that didn't matter. I remember the first time that I noticed that she, when she, I was with her and she was washing my clothes, and she put my clothes in the washing machine, and then she took powdered soap, and she put them all over my blue jeans. And I'm still a stickler about my clothes, by the way. And I was like, ah, you can't do that. You, you can't put powder on my jeans. It, don't, it won't rinse out. You got to dilute the powder first, then put the clothes in. And she's like, well, wash your own jeans. <laughs> and I noticed that over the years, though, that after 26 years of being with her, we now have some of the same sayings, and I've moved a little bit toward her, and she's moved a little bit toward me, and the longer you spend time together, the more you become right. one. Yeah. It's in the secret place with God that we lean in, and the things that really don't matter, don't matter. The things that we get sidetracked with, the things we get upset about, the things that used to bother us, don't seem to have much merit anymore because we've leaned into his goodness and we've leaned into his mercy and he loves us. You'll never understand the Father's love until you've been alone with him. And so at the moment we're alone at the table might be the moment that we get to encounter him in a way we've never encountered him before when others were there with us. It's that lonely place with him that we get to know him, that we get to see him. It's intimacy. It's into you, into me, you see. He's leaning in. We're leaning in. Something's happening. There's a moment of encounter. I begin to know him. He begins to know me like, you know, we think, well, the Lord knows us already, but he wants to get to know us in an intimate place. It's the secret place. It's the place that we spend alone with him. It's your date with destiny. 
It's your date with destiny. Everything that you've ever dreamed of, everything that you've ever hoped of, everything that God ever put in you before the worlds were framed, it's it's this date with destiny that you're alone with God that it begins to be revealed. And when we go through certain situations and we've learned what the table is, when we go through difficult times, we we know that there's a table for us and that we can lean into him and it's going to be well because we've had a date with destiny. And you'll never understand the Father's love till you've been alone. So that you know who he is, who is this Christ, and that Christ is in me and it is my hope of glory. And it's okay to be alone when you know who he is. When you know who he is. And you've been called to this place of belonging to sit at the table. And your name is on the chair. And once you know who you are and who God is, you can then invite others to the table. Because there's an experience inside of you of knowing and that, there's nothing that takes the place of that, of knowing who you are. He prepares this table before us every single day of our life. And at his table, it's not a few breadcrumbs. It's not a few little leftovers. You can come, Heather. It's not a few breadcrumbs, but it's a buffet. Right. Yeah. And there's everything that you need at the table. You know, Jesus always called people, even himself was called by his father. But we're called to this sometimes what seems like a wilderness in our life. It's a time when he pulls us away into the secret place. And oftentimes when we get in those places where it feels like a wilderness, We'll try to go do something to fill this emptiness in our life. We'll go to a party. We'll go to a friend's house. We'll go here or go there trying to find a place where we can fulfill this what feels like loneliness in our life. But I think sometimes if we could just get quiet in this crazy busy world that we're in and we could just get quiet Stop blaming on this or that or this situation that happened or I've been rejected or I've been nobody cares or nobody understands. But lay all of that aside. And in that place of loneliness, hear the voice of God who's saying, come to me. I just want to draw you close into the secret place. What you think is loneliness is actually an invitation. It's a place that I want you to come to the table because I want to lean into you. I want you to feel my heart. I want to touch your life. I want, you to, I want us to become one. I want you to understand who you are and what I've created you to be. It's in those moments of intimacy with God that we find our joy, that we find our peace, that we find rest for our soul, that we find restoration. And it gives us the hope of inviting others to experience what we've experienced. Because you belong. I just want you to put your hand over your heart this morning. You bow your head with me. I'm going to just pray over you this morning. I want you to just, for a moment, let's just be still in this place. If you would, no one get up and move around. Just be reverent to the Holy Spirit right now. Thank you, Father, that I belong. Thank you that you've called me to the table. You've made a special invitation for me.
and that you make your mercies new every day. That I don't come to the table with leftovers from last year or yesterday. But every morning you set a table before me of the goodness, the grace, the mercy of God. And when I come to your table, Lord, you don't see the flaws or the brokenness in my life. You see the destiny. And you begin to heal what hurts. And you make me your own. And the more I lean into you, the more I understand you, the more you reveal yourself to me. And my name is at the table, reserved. Put your name in the blank there, reserved for Marvin. It's a special invitation. It's a place of belonging. It's a place of goodness. So close that I can hear the heartbeat of heaven. So close that I could experience the very breath of God. And I thank you, Lord. Lord, I won't let the craziness of this world around me drown out the sweet voice of your calling. My heart is intent upon you. I'm coming to a date with destiny my life would never be the same. So I come to you with my burdens. I lay them at your feet. I come to you with my brokenness because you are my healer. I come to you with my pain because in my pain You wrap your arms around me at the table and you hold me close. You're my everything. And I long to experience my time with you. You're always good. Your mercies are made new. And I give you thanks for that this day. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name.